in the forefront of all this is, uh, I don't know if you folks can tell looking on my screen, uh, which is where the screw connects to the multi-unit abutment and you have to mill, print, manufacture whatever material it is into this tight space. So I thought this was a good graphic to show. Uh, which is the amount of uh, relief you have off of the top of the multi-unit abutment and uh, and then the bottom of the screw. And, uh, I mean, you can even break off the little piece of uh, titanium that you're trying to mill in this tiny little space. And it's a pretty complicated task to achieve, uh, whether it's additive or subtractive uh, manufacturing. So we've got uh, a lot of different uh, users uh, watching this, uh, new users, uh, new to, to digital, new to full arch, uh, uh, implantology. So I want to kind of make sure everyone has a good uh, normalized sense of what the topic is. And uh, we're essentially discussing the connection types of the screw to the top of the multi-unit. And there's a big uh, trend and tendency now to move away from tie bases and copings because of uh, tie bases debonding and uh, a variety of issues I'd love for you to address. Uh, so uh, we have to go both extremes. Myself, I'm uh, very conservative, so I prefer a, a metal bar, titanium bar, that it, uh, is uh, seated to the multi-unit abutments. Uh, and I know you're on the forefront of going directly to uh, the multi-unit abutment with the zirconia and bypassing the tie base, um, and uh, that's the topic for today. I've had uh, plenty of frustrations with my own uh, uh, multi-units and screws breaking, not only having the screw break in the multi-unit abutment, but then have the, the stock or the stem of the multi-unit abutment uh, break off as well. Uh, so a lot of uh, uh, interest, a lot of great topics to uh, cover with you today. And on the right side of the screen is a little video of the shell or the outside of your of your Powerball, your screw design uh, that shows you the amount of relief you have off the top of the multi. So I'm going to minimize this part of the uh, of the presentation and just go to uh, uh, this uh, case I wanted to load. So I'm glad I'm on this machine which is uh, how we're going to design these full arch cases. So we've got, uh, uh, let's go to remove that. We've got the implants, and then we have uh, the um, uh, implant analogs uh, that are on top of it. And uh, uh, we have the tissue scan, whether you do that with an intraoral scanner or a desktop scanner, it doesn't really matter. And then you've got your uh, wax up, your pre-op, and the area we're focused on is uh, this particular intersection, just so everyone's got a good visual. So let's grab a cross section of this here, and um, let's make sure everybody can uh, follow what we're talking about. Perfect. Oh, kind of hard to see with the, uh, let's go to that and let's zoom in for everyone. Let me move the uh, liner. There we go. This is the intersection we're talking about. And we want to discuss the, uh, uh, how you're applying um, the, the Powerball screw. What are the benefits? What's the argument for taking the zirconia to the direct, uh, directly to the multi-unit abutment? How does your design differ from uh, others on the market? Uh, why, why, why are people who are big fans of the Powerball uh, super excited about it? Um, and I'll turn the stage over to you. Uh, I know that's a lot of topics to cover and uh, let you uh, decide what you want to focus on. Cool. Well, um, can you guys hear me pretty good? Yeah, you're coming Thumbs through. Thumbs up if I see you guys. Yeah, everyone is on mute except on you, and you can take over the presentation and show your screen if you want, uh, yes. or you can speak that? directly. Oh, I you can pull share up. my screen. Hold has disabled participant screen sharing. Can you make me the host again? Yeah. Uh, let's. I'm just going to make you host. There you go. Cool. Yes, continue. I will do, where is mine? Desktop. There you go. I'm gonna go to this. Okay, there cool, you, you guys can see my, 
Yes, you're all good, John. It's like okay, a spectacular. <laughs> okay, let me meet you guys here. Uh, <coughs> like that. All right, cool. If you guys, if you guys don't mind, um, would really, really help me. Those of you that are here, if you guys can turn on your cameras. It's so weird for me to speak to names. It's really, it's really much easier for me to give more off of what I'm doing if I can actually look at names. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it so much. Um, I know the names. I just would love to see you people so I don't feel like I'm just staring at myself and talking to myself. Um, cool. So you guys can see my screen that says Zirconia Dilemma Solved. The dentistry finally made simple. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Spectacular. Well, first things first, I want to I want to thank you, Armin, for uh, doing this. I really want to try to make the um, the format of this more of like a question and answer. You can sort of uh, either debate me or ask me really pointed questions that I may not give off, and I'm more than happy to answer them. Uh, so that's the first thing. I'll go through some a few of my slides just to really bring the point across. Um, secondly, I want to say to my alumni. I love seeing you guys. Um, you're making me super proud. Ari, Ari, Adam, thank you so much. Um, really to make this is my dream. I could only treat X amount of patients, but uh, the fact that you guys are out there doing uh, what I've developed and really making it even better than what I ever thought is really a testament to your commitment to your patients' um, treatment. And I hope uh, those of you that, are, that haven't learned uh, through my institute can learn some, a little bit from here and really adapt this. Um, really, this is uh, uh, when, when Armin said, you know, it's a big deal, it's a, it's a change. Um, I think that before my screw came out, there really wasn't anybody doing this predictably. People were really just playing games. And I'll show you some of the games that people were playing before. I never, nobody ever really stopped to think um, why is it that it does not work? And I think that a lot of people have been um, sort of scared to do something like this because we thought that making a full piece zirconia abutment would be a great idea. And then we learned that, you know, our zirconia abutments break. So as dentists, what we think is we say, hey, if one thing doesn't work, then nothing else is gonna work. And that's one of the first mistakes that we do instead of actually thinking, why doesn't it work? And how can we actually make it work? The other thing that we're really good at doing, and we've done it for so many years, and finally we're starting to stay away from it, is we're trying to think that one concept in dentistry applies to another concept in dentistry. And I would say for many years, we thought that teeth, the concept of teeth, in terms of let's say crown to root ratio, biological width, occlusal forces, um, the way that everything, uh, the way that a periodontal ligament act would be able to be the exact same thing when it comes to the implants. And we learned that implants, titanium are completely different. And I'm here to tell you that titanium is not the same as zirconia. So for those of you that think that you can use a, a titanium screw that was designed for a titanium part and use it in zirconia, you're very uh, uh, sorely mistaken. If you're a company that's listening on to here and you think that you can maybe add some threads to your screw and just say, hey, it's to, to skip the tie base, you're also sadly mistaken. So I really wanna go through this and really show you what I've spent time really thinking about this because um, my process really has fixed the treatment planning part of it. I've sort of solved that. I've solved the way to acquire data. We, we sort of solved that. We solved the way to be able to manufacture it predictably so that the doctor doesn't have to, have to sit there and keep grinding and grinding and not be treating patients. You know, a lot of doctors say, well, I'm not doing what you're doing. I don't have time to sit in the lab. I work three days a week, that's all. And I still have the ability to do surgery, restore, restore cases, and do lab work. And the only reason for that is because I have robots do everything for me. So the last part that we weren't able to had in our, in our errors was how are we gonna do that? We make sure our data is correct 
And the time we capture our data, whether it's photogrammetry, intraoral scanners, and when we create our mill, how do we know that our restoration will always fit? And there was one problem. We already got rid of impressions. Impressions was the biggest problem. Impressions and models created a lot of errors. But the second error that we had a really hard time was meaning that sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, if we weren't careful, was the looting of the tie base. The looting of the tie base to the restoration was the last part that you can do everything perfectly. And if you did not loot that correctly, whether you used the model or didn't, everything went out the window. The other issue that we had is, let's say we did loot the tie base correctly. One of the things that we realized is that even after we produce these restorations and deliver them, we need to be able to maintain them for the patient. And if you think about it, if you're delivering a zirconia restoration with a tie base, and in three or four years, your patient comes back and has a space under the pontic, and they're getting a ton of food stuck, you now need to take this restoration, burn out the tie bases, which takes about 45 minutes, right? If you're lucky enough, Sometimes it could take five, sometimes it could take a half an hour. Then you have to clean it all out. Then you have to apply the porcelain. Then you have to re-loot the tie, the tie bases. And a, a quick appointment could turn into a three hour appointment. When we take the tie base out, when we know that everything is accurate from the mill, when we can now add zirconia, we can add porcelain to our restoration no matter when, it creates a, a back door for us that is so easy to maintain these restorations. The problem is we never had a screw to hold these restorations intact. So let me just start my, rest, my, 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 um, my lecture. Uh, I want you to keep that in mind. Am I, you, guys, you guys are still with me? Yep, Thumbs you're coming up. in clear. Thumbs up. All right, here we go. So how do I know that these things work? I've done them over and over and over and every single time it works. Now, the question is, is that why don't you wanna live in a world where you can go ahead and scan the patient? Is my video going through? It's not working. No video. No video. Hmm, let me see why that's, let me see if I can get out of presentation mode. Uh, give me one second. When I hit the start, uh, let's do it this way. So why not? Do you guys see this? Yep. Why not? Why not live in a world where a patient can come in, do a full arch scan in under one minute, and every single time when you scan them, whether you're 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 having a good day, whether you're having a bad day, every single time it's going to work, no matter what. Every single time, the top, the bottom. It's just so easy. Why go through things that are so much harder? Just because we did it before? For many years, people said that it's not able to be done. Well, one of the problems was always the scan body. The scan body was never designed correctly. So we designed a scan body and we patented the scan body to allow us to be able to do what we need to do. Well, forget the, the data acquiring. That's a whole different lecture. But let's talk about manufacturing our restorations. We're now using zirconia because it's really all that we have that's strong and that's low cost and is easy to manufacture. But in reality, let's talk about it. Zirconia is really brittle. It's a pain in the ass to center. It does not flex. It has no give. The more implants you have, the more likely you are to not have a passive restoration. It's a pain in the butt. It just is. And the tie bases are the biggest pain in the butt. When you don't have any room, right? We talk about, well, Dr. Jonathan, how much room do you need for your restoration? Well, I don't need any room because I don't have a tie base anymore, right? We, remember what I told you, teeth? We talk about teeth. Well, how much, how tall does my prep have to be so that my crown doesn't fall off? What's my feral effect? Well, we don't have a tie base anymore. We're not bonding things. You don't need space, you need thickness. You don't necessarily need space. You know, when you buy a zirconia puck and it says 1100 megapascals, 
that's tested at 1.5 millimeters of thickness. You have a disc that's 10 millimeters thick, that's really, really strong. So when you take a, a tie base and you cement it into the restoration, I don't know, does it really fit? Does it not fit? How many things do I have to do videos to show how well I cement it? Do we have to decide what type of cement I'm gonna use? Am I gonna go to Home Depot to figure out a way to keep my tie base together? Right, you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on equipment, but then you go to Home Depot to keep your things together. I mean, let's, let's be honest. Let's be honest. Let's be honest in the fact that there's a lot of flaws in what we do. And that's the whole thing. We can have an amazing restoration and it explodes. And at the end of the day, the best prep in the world, it explodes, right? You can have a great restoration. It explodes. But let me tell you something. It always breaks in the same place where the tie base is. Because people that design zirconia, they say all day long, let's have a big connector. Make sure you got a big connector. I don't want it to break. Make a big connector. Well, yeah, no problem. I'll make a big connector. But where your tie base is, I'm going to jab a five and a half millimeter hole and make it right through there. I'll give you a air, air connector. And then I'm gonna take cement and I'm gonna bond it in. You're not bonding anything, you're lying. So when you create a hole in your zirconia, it's over. That 1100 megapascals of strength is gone. So we needed to fix that. We needed to get rid of that. And yes, you can put titanium bars, you can do pecton, you can do crystal ultra, but we're talking straight monolithic Zirconia. Here's another case, a case from not mine. This is someone in my area that posted on their Instagram page. They say, oh, look at this great case. I'm giving to my patient. Are you serious? Are you really delivering this? Look at the fractures from the cementation of the tie bases. Look at the open margins. Look at the bacteria that's going to stick there. Look at the lack of cleansability. I mean, you can't, this is not even a doctor doing the work. This is a lab technician charging the doctor money and it's a disaster. And it's not because they're bad doctors. It's not because they're bad technicians. It's because they're using something that I believe is antiquated. If you're using a multi-unit in the mouth and you're using a full contour zirconia and still using a tie base, you're just not doing the latest and greatest of what's out there. Right? I've done these cases and we do them every single day over and over. And I've done them with tie bases. I've designed different tie bases that have different retentive grooves that have different circumferential things. They have different sizes. They have different screws. At the end of the day, your patient bites. And it's inevitable that at one point, the cement will debond. And when it debonds, it's just a scheduling nightmare. Let alone if it breaks, if it breaks, you're in trouble. But I'm gonna show you something about my screw that is truly, un that is truly unbelievable like nothing else in the world of when a, when, a, when a restoration breaks, how it can save you. So how do we solve this problem? You know, some people will just do whatever the hell they want. They say, well, I just, I ordered a screw. I order the screw from the tie base. I go into the, I go into ExoCAD and I save the scene and the library's open and I just print it and everything. And I put the screw in, I have no problems. I have no screw loosening. Well, if you're doing two arches a year, five arches a year, yeah, you're probably not gonna have screw loosening. If you really wanna up your game and do as many as you can and practice for a very long time, Issues are going to happen. And I'm only telling you this because I'm honest with my failures. My biggest complication is debonding of tie bases. It just is. Second is fracture. But debonding was the biggest thing. So if you're just using any screw, if just, you're just doing whatever you want with no science, you, you, don't, you don't care about yourself. You don't care about your profession. You got to care about it. You got to have passion in what you do. You have to really think about what's going on. So I'm sorry, Keith Goldstein in general, but this is a great screw. This is a screw that's designed for a tie base. 
It just is. It's got a traditional top. It's got a flat end. And it's got a couple little screws. You know, a lot of people have this big, the biggest question that people ask is when you do these restorations, how often do you take them out? What they're really asking you is, do you have the guts to take out the screw and possibly strip it and be screwed with a restoration that doesn't come out? Because these tiny little multi-unit screws are good for one torque. Once you torque them, that 1.2 millimeter hex is gone. Raise your hand if you've had that problem with a multi-unit oh, yeah. screw. Oh yeah, because that's why people don't want to take them off. It's easy to take it off. You'd make three little, you'd make five or six occlusal cavities. You unscrew. It's much easier than your hygienist spending twenty-five or thirty minutes to clean it, right? You unscrew, you steam it, you screw it back in, you're done. But if you have unit screws that are going to strip, and you don't really want to be des and have a a multitude of screws that stays in, intact. How much can you charge your patient? Every time you're gonna change my screw, like seriously. And every time I screw it, sometimes it's gonna get it's gonna get stripped. You can't do that. You can't just use a tie based screw and expect it to behave the same in zirconia. It's just completely different. You can't torque a screw in zirconia that's described for titanium. You know, Armin in the beginning showed that little section, that little section that that clamps the screw together. So it clamps the screw, which is in the tie base to the restoration, which is connected to the implant. That little section in titanium can be very thin. You put that in zirconia, the patient functions, boom, it explodes. Forget PMMA. You're trying to do these in PMMA, in two weeks, they're gone. You got screw loosening all the time, let alone tie bases in PMMA. That's a whole other nightmare. So some innovate and some solve and some do whatever they want. So here's my screw. My screw is created. Keith Goldstein, please don't take a snapshot. Just look at it and learn. But essentially, if you look at my screw, it's called the Powerball screw. You're the guy I love. The reason that. it's called. I love him. He supported <laughs> me since the beginning. I'm one of his biggest customers. Give me a break. Um, if you look at the screw, the top is a power, is a is a ball. Essentially, if you look at the, the figure on the right-hand side, the bottom of the screw is round. It's not flat. But not only does the screw have a round top that's robust, it has a, a, a part that's a thick piece of titanium, and then it goes to the actual thread. So that when a patient bites down, instead of all the forces going into the threads where, as Armin said, breaks the screw, and get stuck in your titanium abutment, all the forces go into the thickest portion of the screw. Not only that, when the screw sits inside the zirconia, it's sitting in a round surface so that the forces aren't blunt. They're actually rounded and directed down into the screw as opposed to into the zirconia. And then on top of that, we have a, sc a screw top that's not a traditional screw top. It's a proprietary top, we call it a biaxial top. We're able to change the angle up to 20 degrees and that top will never strip. Because you can see how robust the screw is almost three millimeters wide. And then we added threads to go down into the implant, into the multi-unit. And then what we also did is we're also cognizant of the fact that when you go ahead and mill, sometimes the seat will be full of zirconia. And if you don't clean it well, the seat will now be higher after you center it. So we've had times when you put the screw down and it doesn't make it all the way to the multi-unit. So we've added extra threads to be able to give you a leeway in case your milling machine is not actually calibrated the way it needs to be. This is a quick walk, look about how the screw is designed. Originally, the screw was created on the left, which is why we called it the power ball, because the top is created like a ball. But what we've learned is then we would have to make the screw access hole in the zirconia bigger, creating the zirconia to be weaker. So what we did was we just chopped the sides off. And it's still rounded where it's touching the zirconia. This is what the top looks like, so that you'll never have to worry about stripping that. Here's a case patient went overseas to have a traditional um, 
hybrid restoration done. You can see what happens with traditional titanium hybrid. It's just not the best. It doesn't look that great. But think about this. Imagine you're able to print temporaries. You don't have to waste money on tie bases. You go ahead and throw the screws right in. Boom, it's delivered. You don't have to worry about anything getting debonded. How many people have milled PMMA or printed restorations and the tie bases don't fit? Or the tie bases actually get debonded? It's a nightmare. You don't want complications. You want to keep on going. You never want to stop so that you can treat as many people and change as many people's lives as you can. So you try in the temps, they look spectacular. This is printed. This is next then MFH. Patient is happy. Boom, we finish the restoration, out with the old, in with the new. We mill it. We mill the zirconia straight to the head of the implant, to the, to the head of the multi-unit abutment. When we mill it, the computer does everything. We don't have to do any handiwork. This is how it comes out of the machine. This is what it looks at from the top. You can see the screw seating, how thick it is. It's a thick piece of zirconia where the screw actually sits into. This is the undercasting, which is an exact replica of the multi-unit abutment. And you can see that we've created it not only for multi-unit, but we've created it for Medenti base also, which is a smaller uh, multi-unit that we really believe in. And you can see how it has a channel that it goes through. And then only then, once it gets through the channel, do the threads go through. But it has a nice big seat around ball, which is why we call it the power ball. This is what the screw actually looks like. This is another schematic of it. This is what a cross section, just to give you an idea of what it looks like in construction. Again, this is a transparent view of the model. So you can see how it actually has a big seating section. So when the patient bites, nothing moves and nothing breaks. The purple part is the part that's milled into the zirconia. And this is how the screw fits directly into it. It gets screwed in and holds the restoration intact. Again, this is a close up of what it looks, what the channel looks like. Another beautiful thing is if some of you have ever realized when you get a restoration that has an angled screw channel, what happens to the angled screw channel? needs to over mill to be able to put the screw head in. But in reality, one of the reasons it over mills is that it also has to have room for the tie base. So now instead of having a massive screw channel, we have a tiny little screw channel because we only need the head of the screw to be sticking out. So now we have even thicker zirconia, so we're less likely to have anything breaking. This is what it looks like if you use a Medenti base. This is what it looks like if you use a multi-unit. This is the test that we did, the FEM test that was done back with my co-inventor down. And you can see how the forces go into the shaft of the screw instead of into the threads of the screw. Another thing that we also did is we also are very cognizant of the fact that labs and the traditional uh, dentist who's milling this in their office are not gonna use specific, um, specific milling machine, expensive milling machines to be able to mill everything. In a traditional titanium bar, when you mill a titanium bar to mill that flat seat, you need a flat tool to mill that. But all the tools in zirconia are round. So we created the seat to be round. The purple that you see is the actual tool that's milling the seat in perfect roundness. This is what it looks like. It's very crisp, very strong when it comes to zirconia. These are just some of the cases that we've done. Let me just show you a quick case. Patient comes in, they start, they look like this. We scan them intraorally. We do the, we do the surgery, we temporize them. Then we scan them, then we design them. You can see the bottom is medenti base, the upper is multi-unit. You can see if you look closely at the head where the actual portion of the screw sits is nice and thick and round, just like that. You can see one of them has an angled screw channel. This is a case after once we milled it, and we added uh, Mio porcelain to it, and this is the patient's smile. And this is all done. This is 
the latest and greatest of dentistry is like my implants, pterygoid implants, no tie base, um, full zirconia. And this is just, and fully digital, no model whatsoever, no trying, none of that. There's no parts. It's a very, it's a big saving for you and a big saving for your patients. Um, I sell the screw, obviously. I charge 25 bucks a screw. And that's about it. And now for questions. Go ahead. Yeah, Jonathan, uh, so a lot of questions are coming in through the chat. I don't want to turn anyone's oh. uh, uh, the phones on because it'll be uh, pretty chaotic. So uh, one question is, uh, do you need a special driver? Yeah, so the driver is a biaxial driver that allows you to um, obviously the top is proprietary because I believe that the 1.2 millimeter screw just, just, um, uh, creates way too much, um, stripping and you can't angle it. So yeah, we sell the driver too. Uh, can you divulge how long the screw and the thread size is, or is that proprietary? Uh, you can look it up in the patent. Okay. Uh, next question is, um, if we delivered a print direct to the multi-unit abutment with a different screw, can we switch final to this screw? I mean, you have to redesign the whole thing. There's no way it meets the exact same specs. Correct. Uh, what multi-unit uh, do you use, uh, Jonathan? Softball? Um, for you? I use I use the desk desk multi-unit abutment. Uh, is uh, the screw FDA approved? No screws ever FDA approved. Um, the FDA um, looks at things as different classifications. Um, they look at different devices, whether it's going inside the patient's body, like a multi-unit abutment uh, needs to be fully FDA approved. Um, the facility that makes all of these um, uh, screws are CE approved, but there's no FDA approval. You can't get an FDA approval um, per se on a screw. You can get FDA clearance to say that the screw is safe, but it's like any other titanium screw. Uh, how do you torque it? Uh, 15 to 20 with a hand driver. Hand driver, is finger pressure good enough? Or I use, use one of those, uh, no, no. So one of the things that we found, is a great question actually. One of the things that we found is, remember, titanium has no give. No, uh, sorry, zirconia has no give and titanium is very malleable. So one of the things we found with these restorations is that you can actually torque the screw, screw to 15. The screw will actually deform what we think about like deforming. It will uh, deform back five to six Newton centimeters. So we actually torqued 10 all around, then we torqued 15, then we torqued 20, 10, and then we come back and torque 20 again to make sure if any of them actually got unscrewed. So 10, 15, 20. Uh, can we buy them so in multi-pack? To say that you just have to, you can buy them in a hundred pack. It's one, I saw one at a time, whatever, every different practice is a uh, uh, different volume. So there's no change in costs, $25, one, $25, a thousand, doesn't matter. Okay, there's some multi-unit abutments that have uh, wider space for screws. I think it's Ritter, if I'm not mistaken, uh, or maybe it's Norris Implants as a multi-unit abutment with a, uh, the diameter for the screw is uh, much wider than our uh, RP that we're used to, the traditional Nobel types. Um, so I can tell you that this is designed this is designed for the typical Nobel type. I can tell you the companies, I almost exclusively DES when I can. So I use DES on my Strauman implants. Um, uh, and then um, I use DES for, uh, what I use that? I, I use DES for my Strauman implants. I use Megagen um, from Megagen. I use uh, Norris from Norris and it fits on all, every single one of them. If you have a company that's made, I think, actually it's a great question. I wanted to go back. Ritter does not make their multi-units. DI Bay makes them and their uh, multi-unit is too tall. Although the cir circumference is the same, when it comes to the angled multi-unit, it's actually too tall, so this will not fit. That's good to know. It's always painful when you find out the hard way and you can't engage the threads of your screw and uh, you're just in, you're floating in. Yeah, and I think Keith, 
Keith just said it's a 1.4 decimal bell, Stroman, Biorizons, Megagen, IOS, and Neodem. Yes, that's exactly okay, right. So Thank you, Keith. You don't need me to read these questions. You can see them. Awesome. Well, I, I can't see your face. I'd like to hear your voice. Uh, do we digitally scan the multi-unit, or is there a scan body involved? That's a whole other chapter in itself. Okay. Uh, but the answer is uh, all of those. Uh, what yep. Jonathan was... Uh, uh, one of the things I'd like to interject with uh, m uh, with uh, scan bodies, Jonathan was one of the first people who uh, brought this to light as well. The, the the scan bodies that we're all accustomed to that have been around for years, those are for truth toothborne cases. They're not for edentulous cases. You introduce so much error when you are going from an edentulous ridge to a tall pillar that's uh, very symmetric and round in a traditional scan body. So. For edentulous cases, uh, you need to look to alternatives, and uh, Jonathan, uh, I believe, was the first to patent the multi-unit abutment as a scan body itself. The less you move the camera, the less you change your, your pitch and your roll and the height, because uh, unlike a desktop or a tabletop scanner that always knows the distance to the object it's scanning, an intraoral scanner does not. So you don't want to vary your, your camera, your intraoral scanner too much, and a short, a fat, stubby multi unit abutment that's not symmetric is the best scan body there is. Uh, is there anything else you want to add to that? You said it perfectly. All right, Keith, thanks for uh, helping out with the, uh, the desk, uh, answers to the desk questions. Uh, that's what I use as well as the decimal T's. Uh, well, there was a question about do which labs know how to use your system? Uh, who do you recommend? I know you have the specific designers. Talk about your proprietary system, how uh, your course attendees can use it, only specific labs that know how to design around this uh, uh, are the ones who, who can utilize uh, your material. If you can address that for everyone. Uh, yeah. So, so for a very long time, um, for those of you that have been following me on social media, um, for about four years, um, everybody's been telling me that I would say as the years go by, it's been less and less, but everything that I was doing, people used to call me liars when I posted my x-rays. People used to call me liars when they said I didn't use a model. Uh, they used to tell me these cases aren't real. The, the implants are doctored. The, essentially, the reason that they said that is because they, tr when it's, uh, what was it, Nelson Mandela said, it's only impossible until someone else does it. And, uh, one of the things that was very important to me was to make sure that nobody ever used my system without the proper training. A, because I didn't want them to tell them it didn't work and I don't want them to hurt their, their, their patients. So um, I always kept my libraries, my scan bodies, my parts were purely only for my alumni. And it wasn't like, oh, I didn't want anybody else to use it. I just don't want any patients to get hurt. I wanted you guys not to learn from a video on YouTube or from a cat ray video, I really wanted you to hey spend the time. What? <laughs> Your videos are great, but uh, we're not going to cat ray university only. We got to really spend the time, ask the questions and invest the time for our patients to be able to give the biggest thing. So I kept it for my alumni for a really long time. Um, I think that now that uh, Armin and his team are distributing uh, iMetric, it really sort of, and, and a lot of the education that you gave through that sort of made it an idiot proof system. So I released it for iMetric. If you have iMetric and you buy it through Cataray, then you anybody can design, can use this screw. If you wanna use my scan bodies and do my workflow, um, then you're gonna need the library for ExoCAD. And that is only available to my alumna um, for now. Uh, that's a very clear answer. Thanks for that. That makes because I get that question all the time whether uh, it's exclusive to you. So for as a recap uh, for my team who's listening, your screws are available to anyone through iCam. They get the uh, uh, 3D models from the photogrammetry. It's already embedded in the code, so any designer can. Uh, uh, utilize these screws um, that works out perfectly. And if they want to use your multi-unit abutments for intraoral scanning purposes, they absolutely should take your curriculum, and get very comfortable with the workflow because things can go wrong very, very quickly. Uh, all right. Um, so that answers is the DM available for ExoCAD? You answer that. Uh, 
uh, too, will there be profiles for the IMS mill? I mean, by the time you're done with the design in ExoCAD with what you just said, you already have the construction file, so any milling machine should be able to handle that. Uh, with, the, with the design that you have, it's actually a lot easier to mill the material around the screw than any other uh, format. So uh, you, may, you can even trick the software, call, call it a four-axis milling machine, and uh, still get the exact same fit to the screw. Uh, you're nodding your head so you're agreeing with that. So it's actually the easiest part of the process. Uh, uh, the design makes a, has a huge impact in the, in the uh, milling and printing part of this process. So uh, that answers that question. Uh, that question, uh, Keith is saying the M1.6 screws are used with uh, MIS. Thanks for that, Keith. Uh, is there a fee for the library for the mill and print design? We already answered that. Uh, uh, Carrie Gans wants to know, as a, to a total novice, are you saying that you can scan the wood directly rather than using a scan body to the implants? Yes, anything that you can place in the same position can be used as a scan body. A healing abutment, like in code that's been around for a long time, can be used as a scan body. As long as you know what you're doing, you need to know what happens all the way down the chain, all the way to manufacturing process so that the cam and the tools can read your construction file correctly. But to keep it very simple for you, yes, a multi-unit abutment is actually the best scan body for dentulous cases. Um, right, uh, I just wanna to add to that. Um, the only thing I wanted to add to that, I do agree that a multi-unit abutment is the best scan body in theory. The only issue is, is that you need to decide that when you design your restoration, are you designing what we call a high water restoration? Or are you designing more of like, I would say a cosmetic restoration? A high water restoration means that your multi-unit abutment is supra gingival and you can see all of it 100%. Then it works amazing as a scan body. Now, if you're going to uh, do what I do, which is I create my multi-units are always about one millimeter subgingival, so there's no metal showing through, there's no recession, there's no patient to be able to show through that, then it's not a great scan body because you can't see it. Now you want to start packing cord around a multi-unit, it's just ridiculous. That's why the, I designed my scan body, which is just so easy, which is, I would say, the second best thing other than a multi-unit. The other issue with scanning a multi-unit is that it's titanium and you'd have to powder it. And then when you start powdering it and gingival curricular fluid, it's a whole shit show per se. Yeah. So unless it's super gingival, it's a great scan body and you have to have the library written for it, which I do. Um, but, uh, and with Medit, uh, Armin obviously can talk about that, how he created, you know, the automatic, um, what do you guys call that? Yeah, the AI matching, it actually addresses exactly what you just said. You don't need to image the whole multi-unit abutment. You can just image a section of it, and then the software fills in everything that's sub-G. So it addresses exactly uh, what uh, Jonathan was uh, was mentioning. So uh, same thing with the photogrammetry. If you uh, put the dominoes on top of the multis, uh, we now recommend they use the shortest multi, and that doesn't matter if it's buried in a pool of blood or sub G. Uh, you can you can find the location of those margins without having to retract and give the hemostasis or pack cord, like Jonathan was saying. So, you have solutions. You don't need photogrammetry. Jonathan does a great job of showing you how to uh, get the internal scanners uh, to work properly, give you proper. Uh, models utilize his workflow. Uh, I personally like the precision of the uh, uh, photogrammetry. That was the next question, which is, uh, does this work with PIC? Next question, uh, can they design with three shape? Yes, Jacob Farber has the library and is written for three shape. All right, uh, M1 desk screws won't work with Ritter, FYI. Thanks for that, Hardy. I believe that's it. That was uh, getting a lot of information through a fire hydrant hose. Uh, somebody asked again, so works with pig, question mark? He won't answer that. Um, which is different than the M14. 
Ritter is an M1 uh, M1.6 screw uh, by Keith Goldstein, which is different than the M1.4. Thank you for that information. Uh, John, this is a great impromptu uh, uh, call for a, a webinar. It was great. So a lot of uh, people were interested. We recorded it. Do we, I don't know if you recorded it also. Uh, do we have your permission to post this uh, publicly or you want yeah, to keep it uh, it's totally fine. I wanted to just say one more thing that I forgot to add. So, you know how we talked a little bit about restorations breaking, right? I said to you that they will break at the tie base, always will break down the tie base middle. What happened in the past when your, when your restoration broke down the tie base middle, it broke so much because you couldn't bond it back together. But with this, because the hole is so small, when it fractures, it fractures right down the middle between the two seating portions. What this screw can actually do is when it screws down into the fractured portion, it clamps both pieces, boom, right together. You don't even have to remake the restoration anymore. Obviously, if you have a million different breaks, you're gonna, you're gonna fix it. But if say you have one break, you can actually take this because the screw is designed the way that it is. It clamps the restoration down and in together. So you don't have to redo it. Other screws where they may actually clamp the walls together. Imagine if the restoration is broken and you have a screw that actually works via friction on the walls. What happens to the restoration? Boom. It opens up. Mine works on a downward force as opposed to a lateral force. I hope that makes sense. Keep that in mind. In great sense. Uh, when did you uh, uh, release the screw? Mm, probably during COVID. <laughs> and you said there's quite a few thousand already in use. Yeah, did over a thousand, over a thousand screws. I personally have never had a screw loosening. I've never had a, a screw strip. And I've never had a fracture of a screw. I deal with that all day long. It's time to do it, buddy. Sounds fantastic. Leap of faith. Uh, Jonathan, uh, your friend, this is a great question. Uh, when is your next course? This weekend, right? My next course is on Thursday, and the one after that will be in May in sunny Miami. Cadre always sponsors, so you'll get to maybe see Armin if he's not you know, who knows what he's doing in Hawaii or wherever the hell he is. Um, but the next one is Miami. It's going to be awesome. It's a great location, super, super cool area. So uh, just check my site, smilesyllabus.com, or just uh, follow me on Facebook. I'd love to see you guys and share some of my work with you and hopefully at the end of the day, inspire you to provide better treatment for your patient. You know, it's really not about selling screws. Like I, I do, I do well as a dentist. It's enough. This is really about changing the way that patients receive um, treatment from us, and how their treatment will last, and we'll have ways to be able to not break. And if they do break, we have ways to fix them that are much easier. It's really just about giving the best to your to your patient, and obviously not accepting status quo but just have passion in what you do. Be excited about it. When your patients see, you know, people say to me all the time, how do you do so many cases? What's your marketing? I'm like, dude, any guy on Instagram who's sponsoring his marketing can make your phone ring. Your patients choose you because they see that you have passion in what you do. You're a nerd and you love it. And you love it. You love what you do. You know, like I, I love my Steve Jobs movie, have passion, be crazy and hire a great team. You got all those three together, then then the cases will just keep closing. And then when you're doing the right thing and you know you're giving, you know, state of the art, you're using the right scanners, you're using the right mills, and you're you're putting your passion into your work, it just shows you can't fake that. And for me, it's just so much fun. Like I was saying today, I, I just can't believe if I had to do it the other way, I probably wouldn't do it. I'd go back to MOs and DOs. It's just less of a headache. It's more predictable. Fantastic. Thanks for that uh, burst of energy we all needed. Appreciate your time, and uh, this was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much, Armin. I really appreciate this, uh, you making this happen, and the Cadre team, and 
I hope for you guys that are out there spent the past hour with me or hour or so, it really, um, it really impacted you to maybe think about the way that you're doing things and how you're going to not change them, but improve them. Have an amazing night, guys. Yeah, I think we'll be doing this again. Thank you very much. Bye, guys. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you.